I want to tell Graham he was sensational this morning. You were really amazing, Graham. And you couldn't see it, but when the choir was singing, he was literally about to catapult into your arms. So it was beautiful. Today, as we come to this third sermon in the series on the Lord's Prayer, I do want to say something about the roses on the altar. Two are for your grandchildren and your daughter. <laughs> so the two red roses uh, recognize the two births of two beautiful girls into this family of faith. And the two white roses are for Ruth Allred, who was our senior deacon some years back, and Paul Flocken, who was also a deacon and served faithfully and well, and many of us knew through the years, as one who was here every Sunday to serve. So we remember them with great love as we will have a service tomorrow in thanksgiving for the life of Paul. And Ruth will have her ashes scattered on the ground where she grew up, on a farm in Oklahoma. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. In his little book, The Prayers of Jesus, published in English for the first time in 1967, German biblical scholar Joachim Jeremias shared his findings on the Lord's Prayer, and he wrote, For the first Christians, the Lord's Prayer was a dangerous prayer. They stopped, they knelt, and they placed their faces to the ground when whispering this prayer. They knew it could result in their death. They knew that it was radical and anti-establishment. They knew that emperors and kings would slaughter them if they discovered it was being lifted up to God. So the prayer was prayed with your face in the dust, whispering, hoping only God would hear. Having scoured thousands of prayers over 5,500 years, Jeremiah also shares something that I want to share with you this week. We talked about last week. Nowhere in Judaism, until the words of Jesus, had God been addressed as Abba or Father. Jesus did this for the first time. So again, that intimacy comes out of this prayer. Moreover, Jeremiah revealed that the Lord's Prayer was not commonly prayed in regular worship during the early centuries of the Christian faith. In the Didache, written in the first century, the Lord's Prayer is referred to as the holy treasure of the church. It was not taught to members until they understood its full implications and could grasp the awesome reverence needed to speak each word. Cyril of Jerusalem speaks of it and its use in worship only in the portions of the service in which the baptized could speak, thus reserving for its full use only the members of the faithful. Candidates for baptism, adults at this point in time, sorry, Graham, were instructed to learn the Lord's Prayer on Good Friday, when the catechumens were in their last days of preparing for baptism on that Saturday night, the Easter Vigil, as they prepared to be immersed in the waters of holiness. In other words, you had to be a mature, baptized Christian to even utter the words of this prayer. This remained the way the prayer was prayed until 350 A.D., the first 350 years of our faith. Why all the secrecy? and the veil of separateness related to this prayer? The answer is found in the phrase that we have today, thy kingdom come. The biblical notion of kingdom has definite political overtones. The word for kingdom is basilia, which comes from the word, uh, tied to the word basilica. It can also translate into empire. It would have been political suicide for Jesus to teach his disciples to pray for the coming of a new empire given the Roman Empire of the time. But that's exactly 
what he did when they asked him, how do we pray? This prayer is tantamount to treason in the Roman Empire because this prayer's prayers were serving notice out loud and in not so subtle a way that the imperial reign of Caesar no longer had ultimate claim in their lives. With notice served, what was God's reign on earth going to look like? And how was it going to get, how were we going to get there? Well, the kingdom of God was not something that Jesus came up with on his own. It was the fulfillment of God's plan going all the way back to the Hebrew prophets. Daniel sees night visions of God's kingdom coming to earth. He writes in his seventh chapter of his book, Behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like the Son of Man, whose everlasting dominion shall never pass away. So Daniel poured out his heart to explain that it's heaven coming to earth when the kingdom of God arrives. Jesus picks up on this theme right away at the beginning of his mission. In Mark 1 we read, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. In Luke 17, Jesus declares the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. For Jesus, the kingdom is not so much a place that is being marked on the map of the universe, but an event that touches everything that exists in the universe. From the beginning of scriptures to our current day, God's kingdom coming is the ultimate goal. God's kingdom requires nothing less than the complete change of heart, if we are to name it for what it really is. Jesus spent his entire ministry teaching and preaching and embodying the kingdom of God. And as we have spent the best hours of our lives as Christians in faith the past 2,000 years attempting to grasp this and his intentions of the kingdom coming, we know that it means that justice will come for the poor, that peace will come in our hearts, and then peace will come to the earth and righteousness for all people, equity for every human, dignity for every, every living thing, and hope for the world. That's a lot. But by the end of his life, Jesus had taught us everything we need to know about the kingdom of God. He taught us how to look for it, how to find it, how to create it, how to embrace it, and then how to live it. His lessons ranged from the seeds in the fields in Matthew 13 to the rewards for the poor and the poor in spirit for justice's sake in Matthew 5 to the demanding but absolutely necessary practice of compassion in Matthew 25. The kingdom of God was shorthand for all that he stood for and for the ultimate arrival of God's perfect way on earth. To seek God's kingdom precedes everything else in his teaching and his model for seeking to do God's will it comes to us as children. He says, become like them. If you become like them, then you will enter the kingdom of God. We just heard that, we hear that in the baptismal liturgy. Become like children in order to enter the kingdom. He says that when the children are coming to him, let them come unto me because the kingdom of God belongs to them. So he's telling us time and time again and offering to his disciples and each one of us that so much needs to be improved in our spirituality, in our moral codes, in our freshly crafted theology but it comes down to this package deal. It's about the kingdom of God. In his little book, The Lord's Prayer, Brazilian liberation theologian Leonardo Boff, who, by the way, was silenced by Rome many years ago. When you're silenced by Rome, you're actually silenced by a pope in Rome, and I can guarantee you that Francis would not have silenced this man. But anyway, Leonardo Boff presents three main characteristics of the kingdom of God as he announced Jesus' way to keep in mind. First, he says, God's kingdom is universal. It embraces everything and everyone, not just Christians, everyone, everywhere. It brings liberation to the infrastructures of society, such as sickness, poverty, and death. It resurrects and restructures all relationships. They will be based on the absence of hatred and the plenitude of friendship and fellowship. And the relationships with God will change as well. It will be a loving, not a punitive relationship. God will no longer be seen as a beat-down kind of God. 
God is a loving God, and that's the kingdom of God coming in Jesus' model. He is clear throughout Matthew's gospel that you cannot reduce the kingdom to a certain segment of reality, whether political, religious, or miraculous. Secondly, he says God's kingdom is structural. God's kingdom not only embraces everyone and every, everything, but it calls for a revolution in structure. This is where we don't like it, right? God's kingdom brings total freedom. It is a kingdom of love and justice, not a kingdom like any kingdoms from the past for just us. It is for just everybody. Third, God's kingdom is definitive. It will bring a new heaven and a new earth in which peace, justice, and concord will reign between and among all of God's children. For you and for me, or for anyone, to spiritualize God's kingdom coming doesn't get to the root of Jesus' message. Jesus' coming reign changes, God's coming reign changes everything on earth and in heaven. Most radically, it is about changing relationships. It means that we take each other seriously and embrace each other joyfully. It changes structures that take away the advantages some have over others. And in its final per perfect way, it is definitive. There are no more tanks rolling into Ukraine or missiles being fired into apartment buildings where innocent people live. No more of any of this by anyone, anywhere, anytime. No more empires, no more wars, no more pain or abuse for any one person. God's kingdom coming balances life. Now, can you see why immature Christians in the days of the early faith were not allowed to pray this prayer out loud to start their walk with Jesus? Can you see it? Can we even come close to attaining the kingdom of God in our times in any way? I believe we come close if we return to these three characteristics mentioned above, God's kingdom being universal, structural, and definitive. I was thinking about that this week, about the, the, the words that it would take to bring about the kingdom of God. You know what I came up with? Lauren, you're gonna love this. Bread, to build respect, equality, and dignity into every relationship on earth. That's what bread is, right? To be builders of respect, equality, and dignity, we have to begin by seeing each other in need of prayer. As St. Francis says, we need to seek to understand rather than to be understood. What is, what is it that makes someone who they are and what they are? What brings out their core values in trying times? In my life, I have caught a glimpse of the kingdom of God on a number of occasions but one that takes me back happened in a school while I was doing volunteer uh, work as, as a counselor to a young boy many years ago. For more than 20 years, I volunteered each Friday at Bluffsview Elementary School in Worthington. One year, I had an incredibly challenging third grader with whom I worked. He fidgeted constantly. He kicked and pinched and punched his classmates. He was in constant motion. And it's no wonder that some of his motion collided with other people. I thought often how much tough it must have been to be in his little body, which had no stop button in it. But honestly, I found him irritating. And I, had, and I only had the pleasure of being with him one hour a week, right? There were times that I was like, I know I'm giving the teacher an hour break here, but this is driving me crazy. One week. I saw a whole other side of this child of God. <clears throat> we were joined by our, we were joined by one, uh, one of the other kids in the class for a spelling test. As we sat down, he told me about the tough times that she was facing at home and in school. As she sat there very quietly with her head sort of bowed, he knew all about her challenges, and he named everyone he knew. Of course, it was a little bit humiliating for her. While doing this, he also reassured her that I was OK and that I was a friend to, to him, just like she was, which made me feel really bad about the comments I just made. Right? <laughs> he told her that I was a pastor. And then, without even having a segue, he just 
launched into the Lord's Prayer as he grabbed her hand and started praying for her. He prayed the prayer for her. As the prayer ended, he didn't even stop to say amen, he just kept talking. He told me how he stood by her when she was being bullied. He told me, you know, the one day you saw me being carried off to the principal's office, I had defended her on the playground. That's why I was going to the principal's office. He saw her with loving eyes, and I saw him with fresh eyes. I saw him as a good friend. I saw him as a prayer-filled friend. I saw him standing beside someone who no one else was being kind to in his class, as they were not kind to him either. I saw him as standing with this girl who was frightened and treated cruelly by others. And there she was with tears in her eyes looking at her friend, her defender. And whether he realized it, my fidgeting third grader was bringing in the kingdom of God, the value of love and respect and justice for his classmate as a true friend that she needed in her life. Although he was still a fidget machine, he was fidgeting for justice and for Jesus. And I liked what I saw. How many of us are fidgeting machines? Come on. Mark, Mr. Mark's always asking us to put our hands up. Oh, come on. A lot of us are fidgety machines, right? Or maybe I'm the only one. <laughs> but how many of us fidget for justice and for Jesus? How many of us break into the Lord's Prayer when we see a friend in need and we hold their hand and pray the prayer like it's the last and only prayer they have? How many of us pray our Lord's Prayer in such a radically inclusive way? We are in the season of Lent. This is the time to pick our faces out of the dust where we've been whispering this prayer silently so no one will hear it and pray it like we mean it. This is the time to lift our faces and to face our brokenness and to start to bring in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God will be come to earth when we believe what Jesus was saying and what he gave us to act upon. When we become bearers and bringers of justice through real and growing relationships with one another, then the kingdom of God has a chance to come. If we pray to God, for God's kingdom to come, and we fidget for justice, the tide will turn. May thy kingdom come. Amen.